In 2003, I went to prison. Like Monopoly, though, I was just visiting. I was a rabbinic student, and my mentor at the time had chaplaincy privileges at the Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women, the only maximum security prison for women in New York State. It is well hidden amongst the trees in the hills of the suburbs of Bedford Hills. So you have to take off the main road to get to the campus, filled obviously with guard towers and barbed wire. When you arrive into the main hall, one of the correction officers makes sure you take all of your belongings and put it into a locker. They check your ID and then they put a stamp on your hand, one that is only visible by the black lights that you're going to have to put your hand in in several checkpoints as you walk your way into the prison. Besides, obviously, some of the bars and these checkpoints, the prison looks like any New York State public building that you might have built it, been in, built in the 60s, all the brick, the numbers on the doors, everything kind of looks kind of stale and the same. We make our way to what's called the family room. Many of these women have children, children that they are raising, and on the weekends, the children are allowed to come in, and the mothers are really encouraged to actually spend these quality hours with their children to raise them and obviously to enhance their maternal instinct with their children. At this time, what I did was I prepared a study session about the book of Ruth. These Friday services are advertised to everybody. And so who doesn't want a little bit of grape juice and challah? So there were not just Jews there, there were blacks, there were Latinos, anyone who just wanted some company, perhaps to study a little bit of Bible. These women were really interesting. I didn't ask what they did. We talked about human interest, the idea of the, the feelings of Ruth and Naomi as they go through their travails and how does it connect really to the human spirit, in this case, to the female spirit, the spirit of women. In our debriefs, my mentor and I talked about the experience and he mentioned that two of the older Jewish women that are there, Judy Clark and Kathy Boudin, were perpetrators of the famous 1981 Brinks robbery and murder. I was born in 1977, so I really didn't know what happened in 1981. I did some research. In October 1981, a group of radical leftists robs a, a Brinks armored truck at the Nanuit Mall. In the robbery and botched getaway, one of the guards, Peter Page, and two Nyack police officers, Edward O'Grady and Waverly Brown, were killed. Judy Clark tried to defend herself and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And Boudin plea bargained, which made her eligible for parole. I'm meeting them in prison decades after their crime. And in prison, Clark and Boudin did not seem the monsters who committed the crimes that they did in 1981. As older women in 2003, they cared for the younger inmates. They lived now in cottages on the campus that do not have bars. They have more freedom of movement on the campus. They led a service dog training program where they lived and raised the dogs and they helped the inmates with their schoolworks, getting their GEDs and even their college degrees. In my first pulpit in Massachusetts, as a young rabbi, I gave a Rosh Hashanah sermon about redemption. And I ventured to say that Clark and Boudin had done teshuva. They were no longer violent or hot-headed and didn't spew any leftist ideology as far as I could tell. They used their lives to bring good to the world. My lesson was that Teshuvah and the High Holidays give everyone a chance to repent. And I quoted the famous saying that God waits even to our last breath for repentance. One of the first people to come um, to wish, wish, wish Shana Tava that day, 
told me that he could never forgive Judy or Kathy or any of the terrorists from that day. He was a lawyer. He said he identified himself left of center. But he told me these women and their actions created orphans and widows. The pain and the damage that they could for their naive political actions, now violent, of course, cause could never be undone. He advised me as a young rabbi to be careful about making broad stroke assumptions about redemption. Some people, he said, deserve to rot in jail. The comment sticks with me today. I'm gonna make it a little bit calmer a little bit later. But yes, some crimes are irreparable. There is some pain and wounds that cannot be undone. Ask a Rockland County police supporter about O'Grady and Brown, and they will likely be upset that Clark and Boudin are now walking around free, and Boudin is working for Columbia University. Boudin was paroled in 2008, and Governor Andrew Cuomo at the time granted commutation and parole to Clark in 2019. Does the existence of irreparable harm mean there can never be repentance? Do you always have to rot in jail and be told that you are the irreparable sinner? Can someone be redeemed, perhaps absolved of their guilt after doing penance? I still believe, even after that comment and thinking about it, that teshuva is open to all. But yes, we need to accept that there are gradations of teshuva. Maimonides tells us what is teshuva gimura, and he imagines ideally if you're placed in the exact same situation, you don't do it again. But he also tells us that we need to go and ask for forgiveness. So I imagine teshuva as three stages. One is obviously recognizing that you have a behavior that needs to be fixed. You need to say to yourself, I went on the wrong track. Hopefully for most of us, not as violent as these women, but I went on the wrong track and I need to return to the correct path. That is the teshuva that all of us can do and the one that I believe these women did. And then there's also really acknowledging the deep pain that you might have caused or whatever irreparable harm you're going off the track might have caused. And finally, the hardest one is if you wronged a person, going to that person, offering contrition, and then yes, that person needs to be of the mind, and it is their choice, their own volition, whether to forgive you. Only if all of those three are completed, have you really done teshuva gimura, complete repentance? And we see that in this week's Torah portion, where Judah goes and doesn't know who he's talking to, and really admits to the veiled Joseph that he committed an irreparable crime. He sold Joseph into slavery and pretended to his own father, their own father, that a beast, Toraf, Toraf, tore him away. And Jacob went into a depression that was unendable. And now again, with this opportunity, that again, what's gonna happen, they're gonna go back to Jacob and say, Benjamin again has been torn from you. He would go down, literally die right there. And Judah knows this. And Judah says, I cannot let that happen again. Take me instead, put the guilt on me. And obviously we know that's when Joseph reveals. And then they ask Joseph, please forgive us. What are we gonna do? And Joseph said, it is okay. We found a way to go on the right track. And now I can help you and feed you and be reunited with my father during the rest of the five years of the famine. Rabbi Stenker mentioned that this is not perfect. There are still going to be tensions, but they're able to live together yet again. As far as I know, neither Judy Clark nor Kathy Boudin has reached out to ask forgiveness of the families, nor to express 
remorse, they probably know that that would not be something that they would succeed in. But they have done basic teshuva. They are convicted murderers who have now gone on to the right track. Prison and life got these women and other onto the right track. It doesn't erase their previous actions. Interesting enough, right before she committed the crime, Judy Clark dropped off her infant son at daycare. Just this year, that infant son was elected district attorney in San Francisco. He was raised to be part of the solution, not the problem. So this is how I interpret my story now and would give a different Rosh Hashanah sermon back that I did. We cannot undo the past, but if we get on to the right track and we continue to do what is right and bring right into the world, we may be able to do at least a modicum of teshuva. And if we're able to do even more, to ask for forgiveness and to really know the pain we might have caused, we can do complete teshuva because God really waits until the very end to do teshuva whenever we are ready. Shabbat Shalom.